Hi, I'm Rhys Lawton and this is Mainstream Media, watching the mainstream news so you don't have to. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. So let's chuck a dead cat on the table and tell Sue to clear it up. <laughs> The Prime Minister just about squeaked through another week, didn't he? Just about. He's still there, right? I haven't checked for a few minutes or so. It was all going so well for the PM, wasn't it? Boris Johnson finally getting a grip and putting all those Downing Street lockdown parties behind him. What, really? Another one? The rate of parties going up faster than the Omicron cases, as are the excuses. What's the latest? Nobody told me and nobody, nobody said that uh, this was something that was against the rules, that was a breach of the of the COVID rules, that we were doing something that wasn't a, a work event, because, uh, frankly, I don't think, uh, I can't imagine why on earth it would have gone ahead or why it would have been allowed uh, to go ahead. Nobody told me about the rules, said the guy who wrote the rules. Nobody warned me not to have a party. I mean, a work event. Yes, like nobody warned Lance Armstrong about not doping, Captain Smith about not going near those pesky icebergs, or Prince Andrew about not hanging out with sex traffickers. Boris's latest wriggle was a wriggle too far for many of his own MPs, particularly the 2019 intake, who only got in because he was such a popular guy. Different times. This group dubbed themselves the 109 because there are... Uh, 107 of them. Gives you an idea of who we're dealing with. Or, to quote another, crueler Tory, a bunch of fucking nobodies. Nobody told me. Starts to make sense. This lot launched the pork pie plot, because de facto leader Alicia Kearns represents Melton Mowbray. Where they make the pork pies, keep up. I'm still none the wiser. You never are. Basically, they all wanted a coup. All agreed to send in letters of no confidence, turf out Boris, and have another leadership race. Need 54 letters in total, or 54,000 if you're looking at the Sage modelling. Not there yet. Could still happen, but it all seemed to fall apart a bit. Even though one Tory MP defected to Labour. Christian Wakefield. Wakeford. No idea. Why? Principal? Or because he's in a seat almost certain to turn red next time. Some thought that galvanised the Tories. What a knob! Let's back Boris! Another Tory, Willie Rag, it's his name, stop it, whined that rebels had been blackmailed and intimidated. Yes, that is what whips do! Why else is Gavin Williamson getting a knighthood? In the end, it was left to the guy who fucked up Brexit, David Davis, to wield the rather blunt knife and call for Boris's resignation. His words are spoken by an actor. In the name of God, go! Same to you, Robert. No marks aside, including Peston, I recorded a few bits. Bit of a shock that Boris clung on. Wow, he was gone fast. All hail Prime Minister Dominic Raab and his mighty hands. <laughs> and to really get the PM back on track, Covid's over! Yes, the government says so. Maybe tell the rest of the world? Plan B's out. Back to the office, ignore the COVID passport nonsense, get your masks off. Will you be wearing a face mask? Next Saturday, there won't be a legal requirement. My question was, will you be wearing wear a face, face mask? Masks. Will I be wearing a face mask? Yeah. What? Are you sure about all this? Timing's a bit convenient. Is COVID over? Nah, loads of it about. There's the figures from Wednesday, 94, 432. Or maybe those are the lottery numbers. Nice of the Home Secretary to give them a hand. There have been 300,034, 974,000 tests carried out across the UK. The mainstream press didn't play ball, unfortunately. Still on the PM's woes. Boris clinging on. Plotters in retreat. Crust ahead. It's a pie joke. See what they did there? Oh, sorry. Lame duck. That's what the star's going for at the bottom. For those who remember, a gag made famous by disgraced BBC radio DJ... Is there any other type? Dave Lee Travis. Odd choice. Unfortunately for Boris, all still a bit dicey, because the guy who keeps putting him on the back foot, his former chief advisor turned keyboard warrior, could lob in another grenade at any moment. Dominic Cummings. Yes, it is he, Ming the Merciless, Brexit architect and patient zero for the world's most dangerous eye test. Dom chose this week to reignite the worst of the scandal. That party Johnson did admit going to, but claims was a work thing he just stumbled across, then made his excuses and left. Lies, said Dom. You lied to Parliament, Boris. You knew all about it. We warned you and you wouldn't listen. I'll swear under oath. Easy, Dom. It's not law and order. Just yet. Have a chat with that nice Sue Gray. She's writing a report on all this, don't you know? 
You tell Sue all about it. Sue Gray is conducting an inquiry into the situation. I think it's right that we allow her to conclude that job. And you support, and, and you support the Prime Minister Thanks. unequivocally. He's probably gone to check on Sue. Need to get the big guns out. Shut this down. What about another Dom? Deputy PM Dominic Raab. He'll cancel out Cummings. Watch and learn. There was the speculation that the 20th of May party was held uh, in my honour to thank me. Um, it was just ridiculous. Was it? No, of course not. Ridiculous. So I it was, was a party on the 20th I, no, of exactly. May then? It was, no, exactly. You it, refer to it as the 20th no, no, of May no, no, party? No, this is the claim that was made. I think that made it worse, Dom. You can't kid a kidder. Kay's a dab hand at the whole getting caught having an illegal party malarkey. The week all started so well. The government came up with a carefully crafted blueprint to restore public trust and put forward a clear vision for the country's future. <laughs> nah, just kidding. A few desperate wheezes to save Boris's neck. Operation Save Big Dog. That's Boris, in case you're confused. Why? Well, what do you do for a big dog? You clean up his shit while he licks his balls and has a little sleep. We absolutely do not recognise this phrase, said number 10, so you know it must be true. So, what's at the heart of the plan? Sack the person responsible for the whole mess. Of course! Sorry, Boris. Is that right? If so, it's a bold strategy if the endgame is to save him. Oh it's, oh, it's not him! I don't know, of course not! It's all about who we can sack that isn't Boris to make the whole mess go away. Who will it be? Well, a whole host of familiar faces are getting thrown under the cardboard bus. Top of the list, of course, Martin Reynolds, who sent that party invite. Yes, know him? Naughty, naughty, Mr Party Pants? What about Martin's deputy, Stuart Glassborough? Not sure who he is, to be honest. Or Chief of Staff Dan Rosenfield. Apparently he said there were no parties. Wasn't that Boris? Maybe spinner Jack Doyle? Off spinner Ollie Robinson. I thought he was down under for the ashes. Has anyone checked this? Yes, all the people your average person in the street is really angry with. Definitely not Boris. And if all that doesn't work, maybe drag back Dom Cummins and sack him properly for that lockdown trip to Durham. That might get a cheer. On with strand two of Save Big Dog, Operation Red Meat. All round to Hawksmoor for a work event? No, this was about red meat for the faithful. Rally the troops, some proper populist bullshit to make everyone who voted Bojo remember why. Where did it come from? Well, Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries, apparently. Stop talking about dead cats, i.e. the distraction tactics, like scrapping the Covid rules, perhaps? And start throwing some red meat to the back benches. Like her plan to scrap the BBC. No more dead cats, but here's another one. Nice one, Nad. I guess one less news outlet to drag up old party snaps. Let's also get tough on migrants, criminals and bung more cash for the NHS. Not do it, of course, just say it. Obviously, the leader of the opposition wanted to get stuck into all this too. 14 pints ahead, sorry, points ahead in the polls and rising. Yes, Sir Keir Starmer's never had it so good. Finally time for a beer? I mean, a Keir. A Keir Royale. Quick, team, get out a picture of me cutting loose. I can do this party stuff too. No, Keir, you haven't quite got the point of the... Oh, too late. Drinking a beer, is that reasonably necessary for work purposes? We'd, we'd stopped to eat a takeaway whilst we were working in the office and then we carried on. This was all strand three of Save Big Dog. Yes, the Daily Mail, Starmer's the real problem here, isn't he? Look, everyone was doing it, even St. Leek here. You don't condemn a man um, without a thorough investigation. That's an odd one, Nadim. As Education Secretary, you're meant to be on Boris's side. I get that you fancy a punt at the top job, but even so... Oh, oh, sorry! Wrong clip! That's you talking about Boris! What do you make of Keir? Don't condemn a man without an investigation, am I right? I hope he, he finds uh, you know, within himself to apologise. I think people expect you know, very high standards from, from their leaders. Yes, no investigation for you, Keir! And, OK, he's having a beer, but it looks like a really dull party. Maybe his kind of party. Not really what the PM's doing. No broken swings here. Can he cling on? Kia? Probably. Boris? He might have gone already. <laughs> Shall we have a quick chat about dead cats? Quite a few about this week. If you're a newspaper editor or a telly exec, you can bet there's one under your front wheels right now. Go have a look. 
It's an odd phrase, and a recent one, coined by Boris Johnson's longtime election guru, Linton Crosby, nicknamed the Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Why? Not because he's Australian, though he is. It's because he lives in the shadows and grants wishes to those lacking a heart, brains or courage. The Conservative Party. It's a very simple idea. Distract everyone. Not the sneakiest move, either. Boris told us all about it. There is one thing that is absolutely certain about throwing a dead cat on the dining room table, said he. And I don't mean that people will be outraged, alarmed, disgusted. That is true, but irrelevant. The key point, says my Australian friend, is that everyone will shout, Geez, mate, there's a dead cat on the table. Flawless impression there. The trouble now is that there are so many dead cats flying around, it's hard to know which are intentional and which are just, well, stuff happening. Let's do a quick roundup. Some dead cats are more obviously dead cats. What don't we want people to talk about? Partygate, right? So let's have lots of mad policy announcements. Nadine Dorries let the cat out of the bag by literally saying it, didn't she? OK, she said, enough with the dead cats. Then released one, the BBC funding cat. I mean, cut. But Nadine Dorries saying what she'll do five years from now is on par with me saying what I'll do when I'm Pope. Also, Boris scrapped all the Covid stuff. Plan B in the bin. Yay! Watch out for the Covid, though. We're still pushing 100,000 cases a day. Then there's the migrant crossings. A dead cat with a megaphone shouting, Go away! at boats of desperate people. The Home Secretary's been failing on that score for years. Now the government's sending in the troops. Because blokes with guns always make things better. Maybe have a word with the Navy. It doesn't seem to want to do it. Or use a sonic boom to scare away the migrant boats. That's on the list with the wave machine and the nets, I imagine. You've got Justice Secretary Dom Raab on the loose too. Let magistrates lock people up for longer. Good idea. That'll help with the backlog in the Crown Court. Gold star Dom. Maybe a bill in Parliament? Oh, you're just signing it all off. Huh, I know. Lots of power. You're very important. Only... Actual lawyers, not pretend ones like you, say it'll just mean more work for the Crown Courts. A dead cat eating its own tail there. Bit of a double dead cat, all this crime and justice stuff from Dom and Pretty. Distract from the parties, but also took the heat off them a bit too. See, this week, the House of Lords threw out most of the fascist stuff Pretty sneaked into the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. You know, locking up would-be protesters for just thinking about it. 14 defeats for her. Awkward. And the peers even managed to make misogyny a hate crime too, despite Raab's best efforts to avoid it. Or understand what it means. Misogyny is, of course, uh, absolutely wrong, whether it's uh, a man against a woman uh, or a woman against a man. Well done, you dead cats. I'd almost forgotten how ridiculous he was. Why stop there? How about a new foreign adventure too? Give the cat a gun! Defence Secretary Ben Wallace decided it was time to send troops and weapons to Ukraine. That'll calm it all down a bit. Go round the Germans, though. They don't think it's the best idea. Let's get more ludicrous. What about Matt Hancock taking a dip in the serpentine? Yep, got his kit off and had a swim. Hardly some kind of devious plan, though. He wasn't even meant to be there. It's members only. Wet dead cat? or a sad, washed-up pussy. And what about Chinese spies? The dead cat so secret it might not exist. Yes, communist agents at the heart of Westminster. In inverted commas, because they aren't really. Who is it? No, let me guess. I've read enough John le Carre. Got to be the poshos, right? Nah, too obvious. Nah, too useless. <laughs> no way. Actually, no way is right. Labour MP Barry Gardner's not a Chinese agent. Took cash from Christine Lee, who MI5 claim is one. She says she isn't. Haven't seen any proof yet. Funny that. I suppose it's classified. We know it's true, but it's so secret only we can know about it. OK, then. But seriously, if the spooks really did just get wind of something, they're about four years late. There's The Times reporting on Christine in 2017. She'd been rubbing shoulders with former PM David Cameron, then PM Theresa May, and even, yes, Barry Gardner. A Schrodinger's dead cat, perhaps. A story that's simultaneously fine and a massive security breach until the spooks opened the box during a row about illegal partying. And finally, what about the double-headed dead cat? Prince Andy's court case in New York, remember? Sex assault and battery. Couldn't have been there. He was having a pizza. He knocked Partygate off half the front pages. And the rest? Partygate knocked him off too. No, not like that. He wasn't even there. Was he? Andy, I mean. Or do I mean Boris? Yes, the old dead cat switcheroo. You have mine, I'll have yours. Poor old Andy wandered into the garden and, would you believe it, only happened to find a sex trafficking ring. All while Boris was taking baby Wilf for a pizza in Woking. 
Sounds about right. Let's get an update on that investigation into all those government parties. Waiting for Sue at time of recording, obviously. Yes, the country's most famous civil servant, Sue Gray. That's the trouble with civil servants. They're supposed to be beavering away in the background, doing all the admin, remaining anonymous. Or while the politicians get on with taking the big decisions and getting the flack when things go wrong. Actually, when did either of those last happen? Simpler times. So who sue? Well, career civil servant. So far, so dull. But the one thing the media can agree on is, boy, does she love a good skinful. Is this right? Kind of. Yes, Sue ran a pub in Northern Ireland in the 80s. Finally, someone at the heart of government who can organise a piss-up in a brewery. Conflict of interest? For investigating all kinds of boozy antics? Nah, tough, ruthless, kept the regulars in line. The perfect choice for knowing what a party is when she sees one. Makes a nice change. No one else seems to. Enough of this. Is she any good? Everyone knows that she is a person of great integrity, someone who will investigate this remorselessly and whose conclusions we should wait for. Sounds great, Michael. Except, why are you such a fan? Sure, she's the senior civil servant in your department. Ah, doing a bit of bootlicking. Nice work. Actually, no. She reports to you. Yes, it's that way round. Now, it sounds less like sucking up, more like... Careful, Sue. Remember who you're dealing with. Uh, Michael, you tease. Love the power games, don't you? Think she's married, though. Actually, so are you. Barely. But lots of other ministers are singing her praises, too. Isn't she brilliant? You wait. Just you wait. We need to see the detail, and I no, think no, the course. detail will come with Sue Gray's uh, no, no. report and investigation. Can, can and we, I think but until he we see said, that, sorry, Robert, I want to take Robert, it back to his words. It, 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 it will sure. be unfair. No, no, sure, but, but sure. we do have to nonetheless look at what he said. Do we, Robert? Why bother? Sue Gray can tell us. Yes, Sue's become the answer for everything. Who are you? Wait for Sue's report. Why are you in my house? Sue will decide. Are you wearing my pants? All of that, as you know, is the subject of a, uh, a proper uh, investigation by Sue Gray. The report, though, you'll love it. Pre-order it on Amazon. Buy it for your mates. Did you read her last one? Amazing stuff. Kept to guessing till the final page. Is Boris for it? You just wait. No spoilers. Easy, guys. What if she doesn't say what you lot in the Cabinet want to hear? I'm a bit suspicious. What do they know? I'm not saying Sue's anything other than completely impartial. Although I am saying, because it almost all went a bit wrong. And by wrong, I mean corrupt. The reason she's doing the job at all is because the guy before her, her boss, Simon Case, totally fucked it. Actually, his inquiry went too well. He found he'd been at a couple of the parties. Let's hope Sue wasn't. Would have said by now, surely. But let's look at how this works, and then we might get to why all those guys seem so confident. What's she looking at? Well, the parties, naturally. Boris has been for a chat. Might want to see him again after the Dominic Cummings revelations. There's a long list to get through. Leaving dues, Christmas parties, that quiz, the wine and cheese, and my personal favourite, the piss-ups that required a dash to the co-op to fill a suitcase full of wine where they all got so lashed they broke baby Wolf's swing. All the night before the poor old queen buried her hubby. Amazing timing. It was a bacchanalian feast the night before we bade farewell to the Duke of Edinburgh. If true, what should happen to the staff? Yeah, like, like I say, I, um, that, that game is... A shock. What should happen, seemingly for Nick and the indignant right, is that they should be taken out the back and shot. Easy. Wait for Sue's report. So, what more might Sue reveal? Well, maybe nothing. Yep, done it for you, Sue. Feel free to crib it. No, I'm being serious. The reason why Team Wait for Sue is out in force is because it could just be here's what happened. That's it. Sue could have a go at the office culture, like if Prince Phil dies again, don't have a drink, he's the night before, yeah? He's up on the co-op runs. All Sue can do is present Boris with her report. He can delay it if he wants, ask for stuff to be clarified, even refuse to sign it off. On the off chance it is really bad, he does sign it off and wants to take action against himself, let's pretend that's going to happen, he'd have to refer it to his own ethics advisor. You know? Lord Geit? The guy who looks into breaches of the ministerial code? The guy who just cleared Boris over the whole Flatgate mess? Even when he knew Boris had forgotten to hand over critical WhatsApp chats, which strongly suggested cash for access. And even if Geit gave him a rollicking, who dishes out the punishment to Boris? Yes, you guessed it, the Prime Minister. Happily for Boris, him again. 
There might be some trouble for him after the report. You know how the Met doesn't seem to be doing anything? Said there was a lack of evidence? Even before all the latest stuff, there was that video of Number 10 insiders joking about it all? His fictional party was a business meeting. <laughs> And it was not socially distanced. All a bit dodge? Could all be a cunning plan. They're waiting for Sue too. No, stay with me. See, if they start investigating, that could put Sue's report on ice. Bags are two for one at co-op. If they wait, and that's the claim now, they could have a better chance of collaring a few party goers. Maybe a few big cheeses and big wines too. That said, Given there's a police officer on the door of Downing Street at all times, not to mention cops in and out all the time, and no one noticed any partying, I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> the BBC's under attack! Yes, the nation's favourite state broadcaster. And only one, obviously. Unless you count Channel 4, which I don't. So, why the row? Well, for a so-called weapon of the state, it's not doing a very good job at doing that state's bidding. Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries has declared its days are numbered. In the mail on Sunday, before she told MPs. Gotta feel bad for Sir Lindsay Hoyle, fighting a losing battle with his YOU HAVE TO TELL US FIRST mantra. Sure, it's all part of a plan to distract us from Partygate, but it's also good news for those Tories who think the BBC hasn't been the same since... Well, if we're being honest, since the black and white minstrels got the axe for not being woke enough and the newsreader stopped wearing full evening dress. Ah, happy days. They simply don't make them like that anymore. Too much crap now. Mrs Brown's boys, mostly. In the golden age, they didn't just fill the schedules with rubbish. At 11pm, it was time for the test card, Coco and the National Anthem. Good old GB News, that's how you do state television. Nadine will be proud. So, back to reality. How long's the BBC got? Well, it's gone. You missed it. Nah, not really. In a bit. What's really happening? The end of the licence fee! Actually, no. She stepped back from the brink on that one. Dorries said that the 2027 funding review will be the very last. But when everyone asked what she was going to do instead... I don't know, said Nad. Anyone got any ideas? How about a licence fee? Well, anyway, she is freezing it for two years. £159 a year. That's a cut, if you factor in inflation, of around £2 billion. Ominous? Sure. Unexpected? No. Look, we all know the BBC makes a right pile of toss, but Nad's never been a fan. This has been coming, well, since the coming of the Dorries. Not the content. She loves Strictly. Hint, hint. Go on. ITV letter in the jungle. Maybe the BBC rejected her once too often. Keep fucking off. So what's her issue? Well, loads of them. The one she wants us to focus on is it's hurting the poor. £159 is a lot, especially to the over 75s you've just forced to pay it. I know, a Tory Secretary of State standing up for the little guy. Sure, but there are other ways to help them. Tax cuts, help with energy bills, increased benefits. No, it's all the fault of the licence fee. So what's the real reason? Well, she thinks the Beeb's too woke and too left-wing, but also too snobbish and too elite. Make your mind up. Could be less about the BBC, more that massive chip on your shoulder. They're all out to get you, aren't they? Got to land the first blow in the culture wars. Well, those who want to engage in culture wars, which I don't actually, and I think, you know, so that, that comment that, you know, I've written more books than I've read and, you know, something about being uh, into... I found those comments quite misogynistic. Got that? doesn't want the culture wars, does want to rattle the BBC's cage a bit. And they're having a go because she's a woman. Misogyny is, of course, uh, absolutely wrong, whether it's uh, a, a man against a woman uh, or, or a woman against a man. Leave it, Dom. I'll explain later. Just don't all pile in on Nad, guys. Comedian Mark Thomas looking at you. Oh, you missed Dom Jolly, Nad. He called your promotion to that job some kind of drunk bet. I mean, there is a culture of it, apparently. They're nasty boys. Ignore them. Oh, and Doris says the BBC has a problem with impartiality. Remember, she had to pop at outgoing political editor Laura Koonsberg before Christmas. Odd choice. Laura's normally so on message. Anyway, Nad gave her a right rollicking for quoting a Tory MP who thought the PM looked weak, told Laura it was ridiculous, then denied it was a rebuke, then deleted it. So, 
maybe it was. But that's enough nads. What about the fallout? Well, the BBC moaned about having to make tough decisions about its future. And as you can imagine, dear old auntie got a massive outpouring of support from, uh, the people employed by dear old auntie. There's BBC Breakfast's Dan Walker, literal moving wallpaper, saying the landscape would be much poorer. No, Dan, you would be, by nearly 300k a year. Or footballer turned Brexit saboteur Gary Lineker, the Beeb's top earner, 1.35 million a year, loyally retweeted his employer's press office account. It's just 43p a day, that lot bleated. Look at all the stations you can get. They're even bringing back BBC Three, that really innovative one that they put online only and then got back again. Actually, is that it? Around the same price as the Royals. Think how many palaces we could build. Then there were NAD supporters, those working for non-BBC stations, the Murdoch bots and the Sky drones. They seemed as well-drilled as the Beeb guys. There's talk radio's Julia Hartley Brewer. See what she's done? She's crossed out the stuff she doesn't watch. Because that's how it works, isn't it? I mean, I haven't been to hospital or school recently. Why should I pay for them? Just make it a subscription thing, raged that side. If it's so loved, let people vote with their wallets, rather than threatening them with prison if you dare to claim you don't have a telly or watch the Beeb. And that's a fair point too. But will any of this happen? Nah. Relax. Put on Radio 3, the best state-funded sleeping pill out there. The Beeb will continue churning out the same drivel you'll barely notice. Some cuts, sure, but the first one out the door will be, well, Nadine. Yep, that's the problem with a state-funded broadcaster. Knows how to really whip up a backlash. And Boris, if he is still in charge, will have an easy win by giving her the push. Bloody elites, eh, Nad? <laughs> Havana Syndrome! It's back! Yes, that mysterious illness that only seems to target US spies, sorry, diplomats, is on the rampage. What happened? Don't worry, the Secretary of State has all the facts. If anyone's in the know, it's Blinkin' Tony Blinkin'. We don't know exactly what's happened, and we don't know exactly who is responsible. I'm not a big cheese like you, Tony, but if you don't know what's happened, it might make finding who's responsible a bit tricky, especially if what happened wasn't anything. Good luck, though. The boffins are baffled, aren't they? No idea at all. Hopefully not the same boffins who told us they'd definitely cracked it before Christmas. Said it was all made up, remember? Do they talk to each other, these boffins? Share the research, Google stuff to see what other people thought? No, just do the same as the mainstream papers. Focus on the new stuff. To be fair, the whole point of science is learning from mistakes. The media is all about denying they ever existed. Havana syndrome, though. Now, I know what you're thinking. I really should book a holiday. I've heard Cuba's lovely. Oh, the cocktails, the nightlife, the dancing, the damned catchy song by Camila Cabello. I have to forget the name of it. Well, snap out of that and listen, Reese. Sorry, yes, I'm with you. Me. Like I said, I need a holiday. So, Havana Syndrome, it's serious. Well, it might be. Or it might be a load of conspiracy-laden bunk and that weirdly went mainstream and no one's sure why. Let's start with the facts. Cuba, 2016. It all kicked off big time. A bunch of US diplomats said they felt a bit dizzy and sick, needed a lie down. Didums. No, they said, worse than that. Really bad headaches. Didn't really mention it at the time, because when you're spying, sorry, conducting diplomatic business in a country you're always getting ready to invade, looking a bit sickly isn't great. So what caused it? Too much rum? No, it's the Cubans. Or maybe the Chinese. No, that doesn't sound right. The Russians. Yes, definitely the Russians. In fact, Let's say it's them every time it comes up. Makes it sound more plausible. And the Cubans, I mean the Russians, are using a new weapon. No, we're not, said the Cubans. And the Russians. What kind of shit weapon is this anyway? Who ever heard of a gun that makes someone a bit under the weather? Give us some credit. So this weapon, sonic thing, speculated the press. That's why we can't see it. And sound waves can make people go a bit funny, especially when those sound waves are nickelback. OK, there have been rumours of this kind of weapon for decades. Actually, since, well, Galileo invented sound waves half a millennium ago. Yes, I know he didn't invent them. He nicked them from someone else. This didn't really even start in Cuba either. At the height of the Cold War, both sides thought the other had this kind of weapon. You'd think it would have leaked out by now. Or just a bit paranoid, weren't we? Well, you might have been. I was way too young for that. 
Yes, I was. How dare you? Some efforts to actually make one have been a bit shit. That sonic boom Pretty Patel's using to stop the migrants, anyone? Or what about the one the US had that was so secret that the Daily Star found out about it? A really annoying thing that just pissed everyone off. Like the Daily Star. And America. Good work. Not quite what we're looking for, though. So how is this Havana thing meant to work? Ah! Microwaves. That's it. Use them to fry people's brains like in the movies. Sure. But microwaves are short range. Bit of science. You'd have to stick someone's head in the microwave and close the door. I think they might notice. Let's assume that all happened. How widespread is this nonsense? I mean, this secret weapon. Well, around 200 Americans say they've been affected by it since 2016. Based in China, Russia, Vietnam. All the traditional bogeymen. Oh, and London, Berlin and Washington DC too. For context, 200 is statistically tiny. 66 million Americans say the moon landings were a bit dodge. 50 million subscribe to the QAnon stuff about Donald Trump saving the world from a gang of elite paedophiles. And more than 4 million say they've been kidnapped by aliens. Usually probed, too. Aliens seem to love that. I know that's the first thing I'm going to do if I get a shot at going to a new planet. We don't take any of that lot seriously. Oh, you do. Oh, sorry, didn't see you there. Um, maybe we'll do all that another week, just for you. Well, anyway, there are many other theories about Havana syndrome too. Could be insecticides, something a bit chemically, or maybe it's food poisoning. One study blamed the sound of chirping crickets sending people a bit loopy. I like to think someone might have noticed. <whistles> sorry, can you hear that? Is that, is that a sonic weapon? No, mate, that's the crickets. Are you all right? Too much nickelback? Or it could be absolutely nothing at all. Some kind of mass hysteria. That seems plausible. A bunch of spies, diplomats, in a foreign country are bound to be a bit on edge. Jumping at shadows, checking for reds under the bed, that kind of thing. But none of that explains why this keeps coming back. I get that solving it might put it back on the agenda, but that never seems to happen. But let's dig deeper. Right now, the US is having a big old standoff with Moscow. Might be a coincidence. When else? Well, the incident in 2016. The Americans were busy accusing Russia of meddling in their election. The 2018 one in China? Bit of a trade war between Washington and Beijing. The one involving VP Kamala Harris last year? Vicious briefing wars with China. Look, this is all conjecture, but it's certainly clear that there's overlap. A big old diplomatic row with an old enemy? Chuck in the Havana Syndrome too. The perfect weapon. Not for those using it, especially if it doesn't exist. For those not spies who've been hit. Great for reminding everyone who the good guys are. That's us. Or rather them. So can you hear something? Sorry, my brain's a bit fried. All the telly, probably. <laughs> God, the Aussie Open's dull, isn't it? Are you still watching? All that boring back and forth, rowing with officials? The tennis is pretty shit as well. Especially cos world number one Novak Djokovic crashed out before it even started. Not even Tim Henman had that indignity. Or maybe he did. And at least old Tiger Tim managed to avoid getting deported. Yes, finally a win for Tim. Advantage Henman. It'll be his year, I tell you. Come on, Tim! Yes, Novak, the first professional athlete to be kicked out for not taking drugs. Oh, does like investing in them. Covid ones too. No vaccines, other stuff. That's fine. Poor Novak's back on Serbian soil after PM Scott Morrison's Aussie government finally managed to boot him out. No thanks to those pesky judges. Am I right, pretty? You guys would get on so well, changing the rules, having a go at the courts until they give you the right decision. It all began when Djokovic thought he'd got a Covid vaccine exemption to enter the country from the Australian tennis boards. Because, in fairness, he did. You're meant to be double jabbed. They said, mate, it's all bonza. But after massive political backlash, the whole one rule for him, another for the rest, yes, they have that problem too, the government cancelled his visa. Twice. A court finally agreed that Novak threatened the good order of the Aussie people. Not the health, the vaccine PR campaign, which, to be fair, is doing better than ours. Maybe the first court got a little distracted. Those guys managed to show porn before the big announcement. Before the judge got a firm handle on it, gave the tech guys a stiff rebuke and came to the point. 
Sorry, is this still about penis? Tennis. Tennis! Let's be fair to the guy. The closest he's come to anti-vax is saying he didn't like vaccines, and that was well before the Covid jab existed. Since then, he said he's no expert, keeping an open mind, wouldn't force anyone to take it. And, of course, all his tennis mates backed him. No, they didn't! Distanced themselves massively, like two-time champion grumpy sod of the year, Sir Andy Murray. The lady who gave him my third uh, jab, she works in a hospital in central London, and she told me that every single person that is in ICU and on ventilators are all people that are unvaccinated. That all sounds very plausible, Andy, mate, but by your own admission, that's also your belief, isn't it? Granted, one based in scientific fact. But Andy's on the right side, so it's all fine. Let all that go unchallenged. Novak's not the first and probably not the last sporty type to find his views don't chime with the powers that be. Take Australia again. Yes, all of it. Nah, just the rugby league team. Egg-shaped ball. Stop me if it gets too sporty. Those guys and the ones from neighbouring New Zealand threw the World Cup into crisis in October when they refused to come to the UK. Why? Covid, said the Aussies. All that bubbling and having to quarantine when they went home. Too many rules to follow, forget it! Oh, sorry, Novak, you have to follow all our rules, including the one we changed when you landed. Bunch of cowards, said the British media. They put the whole thing in jeopardy, even sent a WhatsApp rather than say it to our face. Just jump on a flight and play some rugby. Oh, Novak, how dare he jump on a flight to play some tennis? What about the football? No, the other football. Round balls this time. The UK government's latest diktat means unvaxxed Premier League stars won't be given the same treatment as vaxxed ones, even though any health risks are the same. Why? Because the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and, for some reason, Sport, Nadine Dorries, says so. Yes, her again. But remember the start of the pandemic? Way before the vaccines. Just get on with the game, you guys. It'll be fine. Don't worry. You're all at the peak of physical fitness. If you catch COVID, it'll be OK. If it was fine then, is it really a problem now? Yes! There's a pandemic going on. The unvaxxed stars are pariahs. How can they be so selfish? All their teammates hate them. Dock their wages. Ban them from the game. What? To do exactly what we told them to do before, even though the risk to the team, if anything, is less. Yes, how dare they? But it does depend on who they are and which hat they have on. Those playing for the national team are a bit different, aren't they? Five of our brave lions might not be jabbed. What if they can't go to the World Cup? Selfish fuckers, right? Only got themselves to blame. Putting everyone else at risk. No, relief. Whew. Good old Qatar, they can all go. Human rights, what? No, our boys can all go. They're just going to test everyone instead. What a result. Actually, testing does seem sensible. We know you can still get and pass on COVID after your jabs. Might that be a better idea for sport? Make sure no one has it before a game, regardless of jabs? Nah. Oh, actually, look at American football. Yes, I know it's dull and takes a million hours. That guy gets the ball, they crash into each other, he throws it, then they have a break for the ads. Not sure that's it. Let's start again. What shape are the balls again? Nah, forget it. What I do know is not only is vaccine uptake huge, over 90%, they also let the unvaxxed guys play too. How? Testing everyone. Clever. Then again, that lot take anything. Bit cold, pop a pill. Take some Viagra for the game, baby. That'll fit that circulation going right. I, I don't so, know how to move uh, off of that. I don't have any medical background, so I can't. I don't really have a, a response to that. But you, you played, so do, you a must know of, something. A, a lot of us take Viagra, right? Because Viagra opens up the blood Wait, vessels. Sir. Get up! No, that's actually the name of the show. I'm sure it's just coincidence, but Minnesota Vikings quarterback Kirk Cousins had a COVID solution so simple that perhaps only someone whose blood supply isn't going to his brain could have thought of it. Well, I'm going to be vigilant about avoiding a close contact. I've even thought about, should I just set up literally plexiglass around where I sit so that this could never happen again? Um, I've thought about it, because I'm going to do whatever it takes. Magic. Everyone run around in glass boxes. Someone phone Novak. And now for my scream of the week. If you were looking up in the sky last night, you might have spotted a rare spectacle. Um, it is the first full moon of the new year, as we were saying, the wolf moon. There it is, uh, a clear display across the world. Just in case you're wondering, that is the moon. Uh, this uh, Alice's spectacular view in Shrewsbury. Oh, hold on, it's moved on. We, we've also had... Have we had, we had South East London already? That's South this East is London. South East London. Yeah, Elizabeth, thank you for that, Elizabeth. And here we go. Uh, check this one out. This is from June near Bolton. I think that's the same picture. Is it in June or is it June? <laughs> no, that was from June. 
in Bolton. I mean, I think that's one of the worst moon montages we've ever had on this programme. So that's me, Rhys Lawton, and until next time, I will be watching the mainstream news so you don't have to. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. I'll see you next time for another work event. Don't tell Sue. <laughs>